Hello, everybody. Welcome back um, and welcome to the first official part of our Playable City sessions here today. For those that weren't in the morning session, my name's Claire Reddington. I'm the creative director of Watershed and part of the founding team of Playable City. We started Playable City in 2012 in order to put people and play at the heart of the future city using art and create, creative technology to start new conversations about how we might make cities more livable, more open, more human. The annual Playable City Award, as I'm sure many of you know, attracts um, applications from all over the world. And we've done three awards so far. Hello Lamppost by Pan Studio, Tom Armitage and Geordi Gallic. And Ben is... Ben Way, right at the back um, from the Hello Lamppost team, if you want to hear more about that project. Shadowing by Jonathan Chomko and Matthew Rosier, who are going to present that project in this session. And Abanimals by the Laboratory for Architectural Experiments, based in Poland, who are also going to present in this session. And Abanimals has its last day today, so we urge you to get out in the city and go and interact with one of the animals. There's a magical little shy rabbit downstairs that you'll be able to see um, from when it gets dark. The Playable City is a framework to think differently about the city by creating shared experiences through play. Visible, democratic, surprising, inclusive. We want to reuse city infrastructure to create connections. So by transforming city spaces into places of unexpected interaction, interaction that brings people together, we can start a different kind of conversation about what we want from our cities. So our speakers in the first session have all been um, engaged with Playable City um, in different ways. First up, we have Matthew Rosier and Jonathan Chomko of the new and very exciting studio Chomko Rosier, which they founded after winning the Playable City Award, to talk a bit about shadowing, which last year gave memory to Bristol's streetlights and some of the other projects they've been doing. Thank you. Yeah, so we're... Uh design studio based in London and Montreal and um, I'm from an architecture background, he's from an interaction design background so our work sort of uh, blends those worlds, uh, we use technology um, usually in public space scenarios and yeah like Claire said we were born out of the Playable City Award essentially so yeah we're gonna start with shadowing and then just try and explain a bit of what we do in the best way possible, which is probably just showing you some projects. All right, so shadowing, as Claire said, gave memory to streetlights. We installed in around eight locations around the city, and this technology was embedded inside the streetlight. So it looked like a normal streetlight, except it didn't act like a normal streetlight. And the way I kind of thought about it while we were developing it was this, it was basically, like if you look 20 years in the future and advertising is running out of places to advertise, they're going to start projecting on the ground. So this is kind of like, you know, dystopian smart city, except used for art. This is an eight minute video, so we won't show it all to you, but <laughs> there's some really nice moments where people sort of gather around the edge, they kind of go in, do a pattern, and they just figure out how it works. And they end up spending a lot of time <laughs> and they make connections. I remember walking up to one of these um, <laughs> by like Montpellier Sorry. and there's a group of people like their families there's just some couples some random, you know some strangers and they're all in a circle and they you walk up to it and they explain it to you they're like it does this thing it like records you it plays you back and it's it's a really powerful experience to you know have that kind of interaction in public space where usually people are just walking beside each other and that was the so that was the kind of uh, that was the goal of the project to connect people who share the same space but might not share that same space at the same time. Not everyone was drunk when they used it. <laughs> uh, this sort of, I guess, translated into data. This is, this is what's happening. So we've actually got, from Bristol alone, there was over 100,000 of these recordings taken. And as you sort of, I, I think a clear point to make is that the abstraction is important in terms of thinking about privacy and things like that. No one is directly identifiable by these, 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 these shadows. They've been manipulated 
to an extent that you still get the motion, you can still play, you can still capture the um, interaction, but people don't feel like their you know, privacy is infringed on. Um, so you can see a sort of variety of some very normal interactions, some very strange ones, um, and this is, these are all the other ones actually from sort of before 9 p.m. when things get really weird. Um, <laughs> so, but what, what's nice is that it, it's purely a, a play, I suppose it's a playful tool. Rather than specifying a, a set of actions that must take place or saying that this is how you do it, it was purely a thing where people use their own presence, their own shadow, to do with it what they want, where they want to treat it as a piece of art, just to sort of observe. It had a dream state where it would start just cycling back through everyone who'd walked underneath it. Or whether, as children love to do, just sort of chasing your own shadow. And it's, it's literally like a cat chasing its tail. It's, it's amazing. Um, and yeah, I think the really important thing was just how many people, upon going through the feedback of this, how many people were just so open to just instantly accepting what it was and just playing with it. Um, and I think that's why these projects are sort of so, can be so significant because they show that these sort of small um, integrated interventions in the street can actually just provide these continuous automated forms of entertainment and sort of ways just to spend your leisure with people around you in the street. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of other projects we've done since. and. So this one was called Heart of a King, and it was for historic royal palaces in, uh, who sort of look after all the palaces in London. And they wanted us to connect um, visitors to a historical figure going through Whitehall, where there used to be a palace which burned down. Um, and our figure we chose was Charles I, who was executed there. And we wanted visitors to be able to retrace his path before he was executed, but also connect to the emotional state he might have been feeling. So what we created was a, a new form of navigation device where people were just given this, uh, they're called hearts, heart of a king. Yeah, you, you, you're handed this thing and then people don't know where they're going um, and they're just told to follow the beating of this, this, this heart in their hand. So wherever they point this thing, wherever it beats the strongest, so that's sort of representative of Charles's it's, emotional it's state. It's kind of like a, a compass represented through a heartbeat. Yeah, and people don't know where they're going, they just guide themselves through this sense of touch. So you have people essentially so walking around like zombies. Like. And then they just, they follow it's that. Sort of, very sort of meditative. And then they're walking through the park, they're walking through the streets of Whitehall, and then eventually as they get towards the end, this thing speeds up and it speeds up, and you start to create this sort of symbiotic relationship with the character, and then it ends at the, the, the point where he was actually executed. Um, and then I just want to touch upon another sort of application of our work, which, because I mean, Shadowing was clearly a public art piece. Um, and then Historic Royal Palaces was a very different kind of design project. Um, and then this is about uh, trying to engage with participation design. So this was for a, a workshop that we, we led with another, with a group of other um, designers in, in Singapore where there's a very, you know, arguably sort of technocratic sort of society in terms of how decision making is made. So we made these series of objects uh, that would allow people to specify what kind of public interventions they wanted, whether that was seating, whether that was play equipment, whether that was more greenery, whether it was something that needed fixing. So these people that lived in public housing blocks would all receive these little wooden objects that whenever they're, thank you, yeah, whenever they're, they're moved, um, put into another place in the environment, it, it basically it pings their location. So you have this data map sort of evolving that designers can use, that the municipality can use, um, as well as the residents to see sort of both digitally what interventions people are looking for, where, what things need uh, bringing attention to, um, but also this physical and quite playful like build up of these, these fun little, little objects that actually also physically demonstrate what, what people actually are looking for from from their environment. So that was a way of it not being about the technology, but just, you know, this very like human centric and using sort of iconic images from Singapore that people could. Um, uh, and speaking of iconic, what is this shape again? Uh, that's, a, that's a famous uh, playground in, in, in Singapore. It's a dragon shape. And 
Hello. To, to make the intervention, but um, was this all in one place where all the pieces were put, or were they in their separate rooms? No. Did you actually see them all in one room? Can you repeat that question for the video? Yes, I can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> were were the objects all um, in in one place in in the same room or no? Um, everyone in the H uh, they're called HDBs these big public housing blocks um, which have large open public spaces that are shared between you know many many households. So these would all receive some of these in the post, and then um, people would disperse them throughout the public spaces. So it, yeah, it was about you know building up this image throughout the public spaces that would then collect the data as, as well. And it would be an evolving image, and it was the idea is that it would be a sort of conversation piece. And it was also about, it was about persistence. If somebody put one of these little waste bins in a corner and, and it stayed there for a long time, that would, you know, that would show up, that length, that duration would show up on the map. If it was moved a lot, you would see how long it was in each space. So it was kind of like this very, very, very simple but collaborative tool for just speaking to the higher ups about the space you live in. Um, Yes, yeah, so I think we'll we'll leave it we'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> so our next speaker um, is Polish architect, teacher, and thinker Sebastian Dopej, who is working along with his partner Anya, who I think he'll introduce um, on uh, Abanimals. Sebastian. Um, as uh, Claire already mentioned, we are architects. We are practicing architects and uh, urban planners. Uh, we run our think tank LAX uh, with Anya for uh, two years already. Uh, and we are uh, based in, uh, this is us, Anya is there. Uh, we are uh, based in uh, Poland, in Wrocław, which is very, uh, also I would say, an artistic uh, city. Uh, that might be compared with uh, Bristol as well, since we are going to be the European capital of culture next year. So feel invited to come and see how it's going to uh, behave uh, that uh, that year. Um, and we, as a lab, as the architectural practice, we operate on different scales of uh, uh, urban planning uh, in general, with dealing in with dealing with the city. So we do quite some uh, master plans. We do some uh, smaller interventions, and we also try to get involved in the policy making as well. Uh, but what we realized after. Uh, let's say, a few years of practicing, that uh, implementing the master plans uh, that we design takes a hell a lot of time. It takes like 10 to, you know, we, we are just not just too young to even get uh, one done. Uh, so we decided to get involved in something that gives us more immediate results. So we actually saw uh, the first Playable City Award uh, notification, let's say, uh, the year that uh, actually uh, Jonathan, uh, with uh, his colleague, uh, won. So we didn't participate in that one because it was too late, uh, which is good because we would probably lo lose that time. But we uh, hopefully uh, won the second edition. Uh, and we, what we did for this edition, we uh, decided to let's say, change a little bit our attitude, our architectural and urban planning attitude and uh, try to face with technologies, uh, which we had a little bit of uh, attention, what is this, because since we both have smartphones, but what the real technology is, what is available, what we can actually use uh, to, to, to be part of the, of the city uh, landscape of the, of the city, uh, let's say, body uh, that we would like to implement. Uh, so we also uh, started to think again about the city, what our experiences are, that uh, the city is uh, gathering people in the first place, uh, is gathering uh, different attitudes, different uh, behaviors of people, uh, different sp spontaneous reactions and interactions with people uh, all together. Uh, and different, let's say, expressions of their uh, uh, of their uh, mental uh, uh, being, let's say, uh, they, they, their own uh, uh, their own expressions. And we figured out that city offers a lot of spaces for those interactions already, uh, but there is. A, and, and, and city connects people in the, sa uh, in the same place. 
um, and that there is a lot of spaces as well that uh, those interactions could not really occur that much since uh, we operate in the city that we go from one point to another and we get through the spaces of transition in the city and these places uh, uh, are spaces that we do not pay attention to that much anymore uh, since they are not invested uh, enough, uh, since they are not uh, uh, for being there, for uh, enjoying the space at all. So we decided to get that spaces into our, our project, into attention, uh, and we noticed that these spaces have uh, uh, one significant uh, uh, let's say it's not value really, but uh, it makes people get into the process of habituation so people do not uh, uh, really uh, see the elements of the city uh, anymore. They uh, do not feel the connection with the city since that every day they get through the same path. Uh, they stop uh, recognizing the elements of the, of the space anymore, uh, which is the common uh, uh, process in the in, in in the nature. So with our project, we we wanted to break that process of habituation to make people see the elements of the of the city again, uh, to make them interact with those elements and to be more aware of what the cityscape is built of. Uh, that's why we proposed the urbanimal. This was uh, our initial. Uh, GIF image that we submitted for the Playable City Award uh, in which we wanted to describe this intimate uh, interaction with the animals that are pointing out the elements of the, of the city and encouraging people to start seeing those elements and to start behaving in a different way that they usually do in such places of transition. Uh, we've got four animals that interact with different elements of the city and they propose different, uh, let's say, quality uh, to those spaces. So with four animals, we wanted to uh, encourage people in four different ways. So uh, during the process of uh, developing this uh, project, we uh, realized that actually each animal have different personality, apparently. Uh, so the dolphin is very friendly uh, animal. It represents people who enjoy the uh, the city uh, as it is. They, uh, I mean, the animal can easily find every single element of the of the city very enjoyable and would like to play with it. It's very friendly, like a pet uh, animal. Uh, there is a kangaroo, uh, which represents people who knows exactly what the elements of the city and what the functionality of the city can bring them. Uh, so uh, kangaroo exercises with stairs to get better. It represents people who know where certain elements in the city are and they know how to develop themselves uh, in the best possible uh, manner. Uh, there's a rabbit, uh, which is very shy, uh, which has a very shy personality. Uh, it uses the city as the place to hide from the cruel world and to uh, somehow find people around who can take care of them, of, 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 of it, of, of, or of, of his. And, uh, uh, and there's also a beetle. Uh, who is really focused on its own work, which is rolling the ball. So it doesn't really care about the elements of the city, but it constantly stumbles over them. So he knows it's there, but he just don't care. He's so indolent in that case. And this is my favorite. <laughs> it represents me a little bit. Uh, so we've been working over past two months, and no, two, three months already which is one month that uh, the, the animals are uh, set off uh, in, the in the city. Uh, we've been working with Watershed, obviously, uh, with uh, creative technologists, with producers, with a lot of uh, programmers, a lot of, a lot of people who were giving us advices. Uh, we were just trying to grasp those uh, ideas that were there uh, in Watershed, which is very, very uh, creative uh, area. So we uh, actually managed to uh, get the project be done in the best possible manner. Uh, currently we've got uh, eight locations. There is a map. 
uh, that you can see uh, roughly where the location is to uh, so we can uh, check uh, for uh, whether you can find it uh, and uh, try to interact with each animal uh, we had a chance uh, on the day of uh, launching it to see the first impressions of people, how it works. Obviously, the weather was much better than yesterday because <laughs> the, the second chance we had to, uh, to see the herb animals was yesterday. And uh, you probably all know how the weather was uh, since we saw just a few people on the streets. Uh, but, uh, but what we did have was the connection to the internet, which is technology. So we have, uh, the same as the previous team had, uh, the ability to grasp the, <laughs> let's say, shadows of people interacting with the elements uh, and with uh, our animals. So uh, we just prepared some basic reactions uh, to the dolphin and uh, some spontaneous uh, conversations about what is happening around. This is probably beetle. And it uh, actually attracts people somehow. They start glimpsing at the elements. They start behaving in a way that they wouldn't normally. <laughs> I believe they wouldn't, but uh, maybe that's the way that, uh, you know, I'm not from UK, so. <laughs> I can say in, po in Poland, we, don't, we do not normally on the streets behave like that. And in, in, in this matter, we actually succeeded, I hope. What we saw yesterday, what we saw at the beginning of the project and what we saw uh, on GIF files, uh, we probably broke the process of habituation, which was our aim, at least for a few people, and probably we have attracted them to look at the city on the diff from the different perspective and maybe in the future they will, after seeing our urban animals, they will play with the city on the regular basis as well. That's our, let's say, we hope that it will. Thank you. I had a really special moment with Rabbit last week when I totally forgot we'd installed one downstairs at Watershed and walked past and had a huge shock, which made me very happy. I also um, was standing outside Watershed with a famous musician and radio DJ who looked at me and said, I'm smoking some weed and I can see a rabbit, <laughs> which was also one of my favorite moments of animals. I'll tell you who it was later, um, <laughs> for obvious reasons. So our final speaker before we get into um, a discussion is Claire Doherty of the amazing Bristol-based but internationally facing public art agency situations, which she set up in 2003. Claire has worked with us as a judge of the Playable City Award for all three um, awards, but every day they, they create the kinds of extraordinary experiences um, that we look up to and learn from, including Sanctum, which I'm sure many of you have been to. Claire. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really privileged to be on the same stage as these guys, and it's been an absolute joy to judge Playable City in the last few years. Um, I just wondered whether I could take like 10 minutes, really, to reflect on maybe what's at stake and what's changed. Uh, in working in the city as an arts organisation um, over the over the past decade or so. I'm just going to flip back to the beginning. Here you go. Look, you get a quick review. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I think that uh, Situations is Bristol-based and we're incredibly proud to be based here and it's, it's a seedbed, a laboratory for ideas. Right now, we're entering into the 500th continuous hour of Sanctum and I'll come on to that in a little minute, but I wanted to just scoot through some of the observations we've had from projects of the past decade or so, and what that might tell us about makers, producers, artists, and audiences of works and art projects in the city. I think one of the most interesting things to have witnessed is we work in all sorts of different kinds of ways and locations. So we come from a visual arts route, not a creative technology one. We work with public art planners and developers. We also work in visual arts contexts like triennials and biennials and exhibition frameworks. Sometimes we invite an artist who we've been following for a very long time and we just want to make a project happen with them. 
but equally sometimes we're invited to come and think about a new public art program or vision for a city as we did in Oslo in Norway and that requires in a sense a making up a visioning something that hasn't happened before which is an incredibly interesting a risky territory to be operating in the thing that we've experienced uh, and we wrote up as the new rules of public art as a way of advocating for how we want to work with artists over the next decade is that the public are more and more and more open to extraordinary and unexpected encounters. But thinking on Peter Bazalgette's uh, 10 minutes this morning, my question would be, what can those encounters do beyond a passive consumption of entertainment? We absolutely do need the spectacle. It's incredibly exciting to be part of the mass participation of a crowd. But perhaps also in those intimate moments with the rabbit, or in those intimate moments, as you see here, of a crowd listening to 80 songbergs sing back to a piano sonata, there's something going on there. Uh, which is beyond a mass spectacle, which changes people's opinions and connections between each other. Now, in our work, many of, the t many of the things we found is actually one of the most interesting things is to have a set of interventions that are unexpected and unplanned. You see this in Sanctum, in the way in which people come across that and then make it part of the rhythm of their day. There's something interesting here that public space allows us to do, which is the, the allowing the public not to have to plan, book a ticket or cross a threshold. They're much more open to the experience of something, as we've seen in those videos, something that enables them to interact. But what do we mean about interaction and what can that enable beyond perhaps just a passive consumption? Could it be that we could see social change as a, as a response, as a, as a result of that? This is a, a woman crowding her back of her bicycle with flowers that she's basically looted from uh, an intervention that we did in 2006, which was 25,000 flowers coming out of the back of a crashed lorry in the centre of Bristol. No signage, no explanation, no stewarding. It just happened on a single day. And what was interesting about this work was that in some people's mind, it was a gift to the city, flowers which were literally distributed across the city, and in others' minds, it was it was an example of greed, if you like, an example of, of people descending on this lorry of flowers. But what it taught me, this work, this was in 2006, was that actually time is a really interesting material to play with in regards to public art projects. It lasted for a day, and over that day, what we saw was the rhythm of the way in which people were interacting with the work and talking about the work. This was way before Twitter, so it was just like text messages on your Nokia, you know. Um, that, that actually, the, the public artwork changed from monument to a moment of participation. And that was incredibly exciting to think about as a producer. That led to a whole series of works across five cities in New Zealand called One Day Sculpture. This is one of them, a barricade that appeared unannounced across a street in Christmas, uh, during Christmas in Wellington. Uh, this kind of apocalyptic vision that was both sculptural installation and unexplained. And the way in which that set off these interesting fictions there was a way in which this wasn't a comfortable work at all. It was something disruptive. It was something kind of unexplained and rather dark. And I was kind of interested in the ways in which artists could come in very quickly to tell the temperature of a place. Over the last decade, we've written a lot about social engagement. And of course, there's an ethics of social engagement and the artists working through socially and co-producing work. But I'm equally an advocate for artists descending on a place, understanding what it is at the of a hat and doing something nobody expected. This is a work by Thomas Hirshhorn, who arrived in Christchurch on the South Island of New Zealand and created a pimped up car to go alongside the boy racers and sat with it in his very Swiss black suit over 24 hours. The conversations that emerged from that intervention were really fascinating about the understanding of those boy racers of their own identity in their own city. This was pre-earthquake. Equally, in terms of slightly dark and melancholic interventions, we, um, we work with an artist called Michael Selstorfer, and we were asked by the Folkestone Triennial, which is an exhibition of public artworks across the city every three years, across the town, sorry, of, of this seaside town called Folkestone, 
to come up with a public project that would launch the triennial. Now the triennial is usually a set of works that are in place over around three months, some of which remain permanently. And um, what we did here, it was, it was the most simple logistical uh, project we've ever done and the most complicated in terms of keeping it a secret. So eight people knew about this work for a year. We didn't ask any permission. We didn't tell the town council. We didn't tell the police. Basically what we did was we buried £10,000 worth of gold under the sand of Folkestone Beach. And what was absolutely fascinating was that the work, if you like, the artwork, was the reaction, the rumour, the gold rush, the bonkers nature of, of um, heavy metal fans turning up with metal detectors. I don't know what it is about heavy metal fans and metal detectors, but they seem to go really well together. And families turning up with spades. And of course what you had is also that coming into conjunction with all the apparatus of a visual arts exhibition and all the black suited uh, guys coming down from you know, Shoreditch to come and view this contemporary art and standing on the side saying it's exploitative. And, uh, but it, what was fascinating was that it immediately created something which was around the search, the rumour, the desire to be part of something that was bigger than the town itself. This is a permanent artwork because no one will ever know whether all the gold has ever been found. So if you're in Folkestone, I would go down around the winter storms because it might be quite a good time. But, it, but the interactions between people and the social connections meant that people were talking about that place and this place in very, very different kinds of ways and coming at all days and nights to look for the gold. What, what we're a part of is also thinking about time in terms of the unfolding. So I think the other thing is to really shake up what we understand permanence to be in terms of public artworks. We were brought in to think about the public art program for Oslo Harbour in Norway. Uh, we took the £2.5 million budget and we put it into trust and one of the works will unfold over the next 100 years with um, the, the work actually being published in 2114. So that's truly about thinking about the next generation. And also another work there was to protect this piece of land in, on Oslo Harbour in perpetuity for food production. It's slap bang next to the Opera House here on the Opera House roof. And it was changing the politics of who owned that piece of land and whose harbour front was it. So instead of the cafes and the places that need your consumption and the gentrification that might take place, instead what you have is a makeshift bakehouse and a set of allotments and a meeting place for farmers and bakers and organic farmers in and around the city who come there in, and we interact with it in a completely different way. But crucially, what I think has changed in terms of socially engaged public art practice is we've begun to understand what I can call the charismatic object. So often, if I was showing you the last decade of socially engaged practice, it would probably be lots of people sitting around a workshop table looking very earnestly at Apple Macs and having discussions. And I think that we've grown tired of that sense of another workshop, another participatory event. And actually, what these artists are showing us, like Theaster Gates, like Future Farmers, is the compelling image of something weird and wonderful and visually compelling that draws people in to become involved. So this was a bake oven, uh, a, a bake, uh, sorry, an oven boat, which basically uh, they, they canoed around the harbour and then had a series of conversations um, around, around that, the future of that. I could go into other projects that we've done, such as Nowhere Island, which accrued a online remote citizenship around this real life toad New Island nation that went around uh, the southwest coast. But I just wanted to very briefly, finally, just touch on what I might mean by transformation and personal development. So how do we understand something that when something else is going on other than just having a good leisure experience or something fun taking place? And what we found with Nowhere Island was a way of, of actually looking at a depth of engagement, that how people might think about themselves as citizens, or might think about their own nationhood or their understanding of a visiting refugee nation. And that happened through new digital tools that are opening up ways in which you can look after an audience before, during and after a temporary project has taken place. Drawing in people through different voices. We have 52 resident thinkers during Noah Island from all 
sorts of disciplines. So opening that up to really kind of start to imagine new ways of, of being. I'm going to scoot over this just finally to end on Sanctum. So for those of you who haven't been, this is Theastergate's first UK public project. It's built using materials just from this city. So what you see here are the floorboards from Fars Warehouse, a sugar merchant heavily invested in the slave trade, windows from Georgian houses, and bricks from the Salvation Army Citadel. What we've seen over this period of time is if we had just done that as an art intervention, a public art intervention, it would have just been architecture. But this is a social space. Sanctum only exists because the performers and the audience have come and filled it with sound and life. 24 hours a day for 24 days, we have had performers from all over Bristol and passing through Bristol fill it with spoken word, with music, with, with, with very, very different kinds of voices. And my favourite has been the conjunction of this fantastically loud, uh, you really do require sort of ear protectors, rock band, next to the samba band, next to a meditative call to prayer, Muslim call to prayer sung by a woman. So I'm just going to end by showing you this video. <laughs> Um, I wanted to start, I guess, with that sense of the social, which runs through all of the projects that we've heard today, and something that we always we always think a lot about um, the accessible and the social. So not just putting projects in city centres, which feels really important, spreading them out across cities, but also um, I was remembering a conversation between Claire and Richard, who's speaking this afternoon during the judging about post-it notes, and that if a project ends up with a post-it note on it saying press button here it's essentially failed because you've had to kind of create some extra rules people didn't understand and all of the things that you've talked about I think are partly successful because the invitation doesn't require a knowledge of rules um, all of them don't require special technology or um, or some understanding of a convention a visual art convention they're simply kind of creating spaces for people and I wondered if you could kind of talk more about about that. Yeah. Go, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Yeah, um, I think I sort of think of them as sort of creating archetypal forms or experiences where, because of all of your existing knowledge of how, how things things work in a place, they can you can have a thing and it can be appropriated in any way that you sort of see fit for that, that sort of moment. And I think that's something that's been running through design for a, a long a long time and um, if you think of really great like you know playgrounds for example and things like that or or social spaces in cities they're often places where they can be you know appropriated by adults children um so that you can have these meetings that aren't so sort of defined and i think that's a really important part in sort of the tools we try and create through interactive interactive works I honestly, I can only agree that uh, manuals in general are the relics of uh, medieval ages. I, I believe. Uh, if you That's buy Twitter gold. <laughs> 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 yeah, and in general, whatever technology you buy nowadays, it does not include a manual at all, or it uh, redirects you to the website where you can find more tips. Uh, about how to use uh, the device you just bought. But uh, in general, 
the let's say the most the companies that are uh, considered the most creative they just do not use manuals because they believe that uh, the technology might have to be used as the, on the let's say um, as you know as a device of, for a regular for a normal day with without actually r referring to uh, whatever was written so and i believe that whatever happens in the city in that case uh, cannot even have uh, a word written uh, because otherwise it stops from interacting with with it somehow there's an interesting question though isn't there which is that a lot of uh, these projects um, benefit from then going deeper. So the, there's a question saying, I, I don't think we need instructions, but, um, but sometimes uh, audiences want to go deeper, you know, rather than the, the fleeting encounter that was kind of fun and playful. So I, th I think one of the things social media allows for is then that exploration, which is really exciting. Because if you think about a gallery experience, primarily, you know, you're supposed to have your leaflet and everything else. And doing away with all of that paraphernalia, the wall text, the, the leaflet, is ver incredibly exciting. But I, th I think, you know, with urban um, animals, it's then how do, you, how do you then interact and play? And then if you want to kind of find out more or you want to find out more what other kinds of experiences like that you could have, it's then being, you know, the, perhaps the producers then being able to unfold that and open that up. I think in some I ways. think that was just that unfolding. Um, I hadn't really thought about public art and unboxing videos before, but um, <laughs> there's a kind of really interesting um, kind of relationship between how the, the documentation, I guess, and all of us use the documentation of other people to show our work, which is which is. Um, kind of really exciting because perhaps they're the most um, manifest of the fact that they don't exist without the audience and that the audience are creating and making these pieces, which is super yeah, exciting. Absolutely. Questions? Hi. So um, I was just making a comment on, it sounds like you're talking about guidance in a way. So once um, an event are happening, any, anything that has occurred um, that is very of the moment and not of the monument, there is that want to go deeper. I think the, the the act of a guide is something that actually we very much default to the internet these days mm -hmm. for. So to actually go deeper and to design for deeper exploration, um, is there anything maybe you guys have tried or seen that works really well with these kind of um, installations? Claire? Well, I mean, first thing I'd say is face-to-face, -face, you know, offline. Uh, I don't know what the term is, but anyway, Claire will know. <laughs> but uh, IRL. people. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the first thing is a set of conversations, and that might be in hosts as there are at Sanctum, or it might be in opportunities for people to kind of uh, have those conversations outside of the experience. So that's the first thing. But yeah, I, I think some of the best things. I mean, there's a there's an app, mobile app, uh, you can download in Bristol called Miss Sorts, which is a permanent public artwork, Sam work in Bristol. And um, um and you can you can experience that work, but then there's a whole other set of things on the app that can take you off to hear the artist talking about the work, uh, to then hear about the putting together of the soundtrack by the keyboard player of the jam, um, and a number of other things. So there's ways in which you can then take people out to give them those additional layers if they want it so it's not sort of overloaded I think in some ways. I think there's I mean there's guidance but also when you're making work in a city and and especially if you've got eight locations in your city the audience become your ushers and invigilators yeah. also yeah. which is really exciting because mm -hmm. there's a lot of the time although as you will have seen we have um, kind of virtual eyes on the work um, we also rely on people to inevitably say it's gone down it's broken or the really lovely thing of the way they start to um, describe it to the next person that's come along um, and that those descriptions are the things that make the work for me I sort of enjoyed my conversations with the um, with the hosts of Sanctum as much as Sanctum themselves <laughs> because they were like oh and yesterday this happened and then this is and and they've just been there and lived it in a really different way which is really lovely I think we've got another question over here maybe oh, one at the back and then we'll go there Hi, um, I'm really interested to see what you think the social change might be, not 
now or in five years time but in 10 or 20 years time for some of the work that you're doing yeah some of those new interactions some of those new ways of behaving <laughs> where do you see them playing out in the long term this is, um, I think this is a really interesting question for everybody working in this space because especially when you're working in cities, they're very complex ecologies and understanding what the impact of this work is alongside all the many other things that are happening in the city is one thing, but also finding the kinds of ways to explain change in a way that doesn't feel um, linear or, re or reducing of the thing that you're doing feels really important. Um. I think there's there's sort of two two aspects. Um, the first is this, as we were just talking about this this barrier to entry. Um, I think that's a really Im important point um, because while the internet obviously has provided incredible opportunities for forming networks and bringing up issues and things like that, it still requires a level of engagement that you've sort of um, initiated. So I think one one key thing is that works in public spaces can start to do um, is basically open up like that that sort of point where you can then drop in drop in deeper uh, through engagement at, at street level and automation can help that um, but the uh, the other key point I think that projects like these um, are important for is that it, it shows that innovation at a sort of a municipal level is actually very important and it's something that needs to be considered more in the same way in traditional urban planning you considered all aspects of life not just you know functionality uh, your your work your work life but you actually considered what people need from their um, daily lives from their experiences um, so to push research and innovation within that sector of you know in public life how how these things can be included and actually really push the, the barrier for, for what, what, what we can expect of a city, of streets, of public life, is actually, I think, a really important social change to start pursuing and thinking about. And when, I mean, somebody said of your project in, um, I always say Harkliff, but I'm, I'm actually unclear whether it was Harkliff, but it they was. say, okay, they used, they say, um, this used to be a space for mugging and now people come here to play. And I think those are the, um, and I know that when I read a comment in the, in a Folkestone newspaper, which is, you know, I came here and talked to people I never would have talked to before. And I think we're, we're kind of getting those kinds of reactions to Abanimals as well. It's that those connections that seem to, the stuff Start of something, it feels like these projects are. And also, if I may uh, <laughs> relate to this question uh, quickly and refer to the previous session where it was uh, said that people always want uh, what they already seen and this is what they expect from the city to offer. And so, with such projects that we presented today, I believe people will just have this menu a little bit bigger right now. So, they already experienced something new and then for the future maybe they will expect something more extraordinary from the city and thus the city could develop quicker in a let's say more creative better direction that's our approach for the next thousand years maybe will we'll not succeed but. I mean Claire how do you pitch this stuff what do you say to people when they're going to in that transaction between funding and commission where you're having to promise something and that something might pay off in a hundred years time what's that conversation well I, I, on there's a number of different levels that it works on I think Theaster Gates is a really good example of um, the symbolic value of um, extraordinary projects that use the resources that we have yeah. at our own hands. So within the context of the Festival of the Future City, I think the question is how do artists and creative practitioners sh give us other solutions? Um, and But recognise that a city is in a constant state of becoming. So rather than having grand strategic plans, which we need on the one hand, perhaps we also need more provisional uh, slightly baggier uh, symbolic gestures um, uh, we heard from Assemble last night in in, um, in Arnolfini we've heard from Theaster Gates so I think these projects can operate on a on a smaller symbolic level that then actually create change more broadly but the other thing I would say is is that um, uh, we kind of smuggle 
uh, projects <laughs> in. And usually what we do is, um, I have this whole conversation with people, it usually begins with Gormley, and um, uh, most cities and towns uh, internationally uh, we'll start by saying we'd quite like an anti-Gormley, please, and um, and <laughs> then I'll I'll sort of slowly. If this is Gormley, I'll sort of move Gormley out of the conversation. And then what we do is we have a conversation about actually what do you want to do, what do you want to do? That might be emerging artists, that might be city planners, that might be civic leaders, and usually it's around transformation of some kind transformation of, of a place's identity, transformation of a particular area of deprivation, etc., etc. And what I tend to say is, um, you might not know what you're going to get, but I will get you there. Um, just trust us and trust the artist to do something you never expected was going to happen, and it won't be shaped like a Gormley. And so our job is to try and get away from the cultural arms race that is essentially a, a set of larger, uh, phallic symbols, <laughs> our public art <laughs> monuments, and move towards the things that are making a difference, which is intimate encounters and opportunities for people to connect with each other, which is what these projects do. When Theaster Gates came to Bristol, he said, what's missing in this city? And we talked about the intimate. So Sanctum operates in the shadow of the building of the Bristol Arena, and so maybe it's symbolic in terms of social change that as much as a 30,000-seater, 80 million pound arena, we also need smaller platforms where people come together. Which I think is a beautiful moment to close uh, this session. Sorry. <laughs>